So good uh, morning in the US, good afternoon in Europe. My name is Chris Teal. I'm Senior Vice President Market Access based in London for Ipsos Mori. And I'm joined by my colleague uh, Jason Boller, who's Senior Vice President Market Access based in Chicago. Uh, welcome to our webinar, The Future of Pharmaceutical Pricing, Affordability, Evidence and Value Attribution. Before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the contribution to this webinar of many of our colleagues, both the uh, market access team uh, in the EU led by Richard Tolley, uh, the team based in the US led by um, uh, Jason Boller, and the team based in Singapore uh, led by uh, Adrian Grass. Also acknowledge the contribution of our digital and connected health center of expertise in Ipsos, our multi-source data strategies, and our syndicated real world evidence services. And as, as we all know, evident healthcare is evolving rapidly. And as recently as last uh, December, ISPOR published its top 10 trends, which uh, I, I'm showing you on the left hand side of the slide now. Um, in parallel with this, Ipsos has identified a series of game changes around healthcare, the science and technologies evolution, which has been, I suppose, accelerated with the COVID-19 pandemic, the move towards digital and connected health, holistic assessment of healthcare, multi-source data, and many other things. And most of these are summarized in our syndicated uh, uh, product, Digital Doctor, which we launched uh, a few weeks ago. However, approaches to pharmaceutical pricing are certainly evolving less rapidly. And as you'll be aware, the traditional three are cost plus pricing, where the pricing is based on the cost of manufacturing the product plus a specified margin, which is only really adopted in a very few areas of the world. Competitor pricing, where pricing is based on how competitors price their product. And you price yourself at either a discount or a premium, depending on your relative clinical effectiveness uh, and basically how you stack up against your competition. And with a trend towards value-based pricing, where pricing is based on the perceived value to the customer. However, we, we in Ipsos believe that the approach to pricing needs to be re-engineered to address the, those four biggest game changes that Ipsos has identified. And, and I'll rapidly uh, repeat those. First of all, there is the uh, science and technology, and that is clearly the, the single biggest disruptor that we're seeing in healthcare landscape as we go forward. There's a shift in focus from the assessment of a drug, a diagnosis, diagnostic or a device in isolation to a much more holistic assessment of the value of healthcare, whether it's including disease prevention and disease management. We're seeing a shift towards connected health, the linking of patient level, often real world and often real time data to, together with precision medicine, biomarkers, genomics and the world of personalized healthcare. And we're seeing multi-source data and regulatory and health technology assessments are increasingly embracing data and evidence beyond traditional randomized controlled trials. So our hypothesis is that pricing negotiation going forward will increasingly need to consider three things, affordability, evidence availability, and something we'll come on to in greater detail later in this webinar, value attribution. And, and I think affordability links has really two components. It's where you have to link your pricing to ability to pay and where you have to link your pricing to the timing of the payment uh, because we're increasingly seeing some things, areas of high price density where we have a high single upfront payment with long-term outcomes and certainty as we're seeing currently with cell and gene therapies. Evidence availability is an interesting one because it splits up into two buckets. You're having to negotiate your price based on very little data versus your price based on an abundance of data. Little data may be single arm open label studies being the basis for your licensure, tumor agnostic licensure in oncology, leading to actually having to negotiate and set prices in indications where there is actually no clinical data. And, and value attribution, where you're, you're, you're actually looking at where the value comes from. The, the issue of where you're pricing a combination of products, typically in oncology, or stacks of products where you have probably even more than two, maybe three products. 
and 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 pricing based on the codependent value that's spread across multiple manufacturers and multiple technologies, which we're seeing with the, the fusing of precision medicine, genomics, and digital health, the apps, the wearables, the machine learning, the artificial intelligence. So we'll start with affordability. Uh, now, affordability is a global problem with significant consequences for patients. We in Ipsos uh, undertook a global health service monitor in December of last year. And you see in this slide on the left, you see there are lots of countries where affordability and affordability of good health care is, is, is very, very difficult. South Africa's, Peru's, Latin markets, uh, and even some uh, Eastern European markets. And at the bottom, you see countries like Sweden, South Korea, Great Britain, Netherlands, and Canada, where there is a perception that healthcare is more affordable. But of course, all of this has, um, affordability has significant consequences for uh, patients, as you see on the right-hand side of my slide, based on claims data in 2019 in the US, which shows the um, the way, rate at which uh, patients who start a new therapy abandon prescriptions at pharmacies with increasing frequency as prescription costs rise. So uh, I saw that personally also in work that I did in the past in non-small cell lung cancer, where I think up to 40% of patients prescribed oral TKIs were not actually cashing in their um, their, their, their scripts at the pharmacy in 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 a, in a, in a, in an end of life condition the other thing i think we need to look at is the, and recognize is that pricing needs to be linked to ability to pay uh, and there are quite a few solutions that are currently developed are being developed by the pharma industry where you know brands that are specific to emerging markets where incomes are much lower uh, and affordability is much uh, more of a challenge. The use of data as a currency, where price is traded for access to real-world data. Pharma companies are supporting infrastructure. They're training HCPs. They're facilitating clinics for screening and diagnosis. They're, they are donating a free drug to eligible patients, and they're, 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 they're forwarding uh, affordability programs and loyalty schemes. All of these, I think, require two particular skills, the skill of coordination and the skill of collaboration, the ability to work with government officials, with non-government organizations, uh, and programs that are actually exquisitely tailored to the country's health system to deliver medicines that will be locally affordable uh, for, for patients. And, you know, it's not uncommon for market research and access agencies such as Ipsos to work with international development space. And, and we, we've recently been working with Population uh, Services International, uh, a non-governmental organization under funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to look at, um, at some of the issues within uh, HIV. And as I mentioned earlier, certain situations require pricing to be linked to the timing of payment. Of payment. So the actual funding uh, system is probably arguably not fit for purpose uh, for the future. And let's take, for example, gene therapy, which presents specific challenges. Clearly, cost is the biggest concern. These costs of these therapies, as we know from recent cases, can be extremely expensive in the 400,000 to even one to two million dollar range. And further challenge is the timing of this cost. The fact that all or most of the costs are often upfront and not borne over time as you get with chronic, uh, chronic treatments. There is uncertainty around long-term benefit. Uh, often these therapies like the gene therapies have been on an expedited regulatory pathway and they may hence yield shorter term data on efficacy that is needed to, to prove the long-term benefits of the therapy. Uh, and this uh, can cause uh, significant uh, challenges uh, relating to funding something up front for when there's great uncertainty in the longer term. There's also the challenge payers are pointing out to how you define value. Uh, and many payers are often resistant to the idea of pricing and reimbursement being tied to measurements which are novel compared to the one which they like, which is the offset of medical cost. 
And But as you've seen in recent developments with uh, in gene therapies, a lot of these problems appear to be solved, but in actual fact, they haven't, because there are certain future concerns that the current gene therapies tend to be niche areas, rare diseases, with a significant quality of life value. But if you look at the pipelines in gene therapies that cure mainstream chronic diseases um, involving large populations, they would face significant pricing challenges going forward, which is one to think about as we go forward. Um, and, and also, I think one of the things we need to consider is that funding flows may need to be changed to relieve financial pressures. Uh, a gene therapy creates significant administrative and financial pressure on providers. Yeah, often there are needs to change the billing and coding systems. And, and one also needs to look at the, uh, the supply chain. Payers often encounter additional financial pressures in the form of markups from hospitals or specialized treatment centers. And if, if they're being charged at a percentage of the payment, and the payment is a million dollars, then uh, you have a, a big problem. So, you know, one of the options is for payers to purchase the gene therapies directly from the manufacturer and pay the manufacturer directly to avoid uh, markup. Uh, <clears throat> traditional financial mechanisms are often not ad adequate, and alternative payment models are obviously often being considered, some of which from different industries, from the financial services sector, for example. Uh, and you see here some of the approaches that, 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 we, that we're seeing and are being experimented with. But the key message is that all of those uh, funding mechanisms have pros and cons. All of them are situation dependent. All require close collaboration between the manufacturer and the payer. Most of them require ongoing real-world data capture, and some may involve the involvement of an intermediary or, or, or a broker. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Jason in the US to give a, a particular spin from a US perspective on the issue of affordability. Over to you, Jason. Hey, thanks, Chris. And uh, hello, everyone. So say in the US, um, you know, the spotlight has been on affordability and drug pricing and drug spend for the last several years. You know, lots of uh, discussion around on the patient side, looking at their affordability in terms of high, high deductible health plans, co-insurance rates, Part, Part D benefit designs, um, looking at copay accumulators and maximizers. On the government side, the numerous policy proposals of the last several years aimed at reducing drug spend, including looking at rebates, drug importation, international reference pricing, allowing Medicare to negotiate. On the, the employer side, look at self and employers, lots of interest on their end around reducing drug spend and uh, prices, leading to the formation of employer coalitions to improve their bargaining power, to help them spread risk, and, but also to advance their policy agenda. Um, I don't know if you can read the screen here, but really this is an, an ex excerpt from the Employers Rx looking at their agenda for this year which gets into things like advocating to allow Medicare to negotiate uh, the price for certain drugs or to implement uh, caps on or price inflation caps and then eliminating the buy and bill incentive. I say in general, again, this has been a hot topic for years. And um, you know, the question now is, you know, you know, why now, why today? Like really what's changing that you know, this is doing the spotlight and work in the scale? And recently I was uh, speaking with a client and she asked a very provocative question around, you know, are we reaching a point in the US um, based on the innovation we're seeing where the US model may break? We're really focused on the, the self-funded employer mark, uh, model and commercial markets that you look at a lot of these self-funded employers with, empl with a membership or employees less than 5,000, their ability to pay for some of these therapies is a very dimension that can really impact their budget. So the question is, you know, how sustainable is this as more and more therapies like this come to market where it may not be any one individual drug or therapy or TA that causes a tipping point, but just at a macro level, the culmination of all these therapies impacting the self-funded self employer's ability to really pay for, pay for this innovation. And I think that begs a question of you know, really where is this going in the next several years and then what does it mean to, you know, to you as you're building your access strategies? And really just a couple of pages here. Uh, go ahead, Chris, the next page. So really just some thoughts on how this can evolve from a, just looking at just right now only the high cost oncology, rare disease, cell gene therapies, where, you know, the top one looks at, again, this idea that for employers of sharing risk, entering into coalitions to share risk, purchasing stop loss insurance, what that means for manufacturers, 
is as they do that, it's you know engaging new stakeholders in terms of value proposition and BBC discussions, having to engage stop loss carriers or at the employer coalition level to influence access decision making. Um, in the event that Medicare is allowed to negotiate drug prices for certain therapies, that is a very that's a very different dynamic. And for Medicare, they will likely want tools at their disposal to really help inform like their pricing calculation decisions. So it wouldn't be unexpected for them to look at international uh, reference, international benchmarks or ISO-like assessments to help them make decisions or inform what the price should be of the negotiating. And really the last two just get into this idea of pay over time, demand for VBCs for therapies where the high, high cost up front, but uncertain outcomes. And really it's ensuring that your value property your price reflects that value of the therapy, the value over time, so that value aligns with the revenue recognition, but also from an outcome standpoint, ensuring that the price reflects you know, different outcome scenarios. You know, is it a binary situation where there's a very clear outcome of it works or it doesn't, or are the outcomes more of a scale where there is value in a, a partial response or value when even like a second therapy or second course is needed? Uh, we go to the next page. And, and more generally speaking, um, you know, there's a few other things to look at, you know, one around indication-based pricing and formularies. That's been going on for, again, for years now. But you know, there is a recognition that at an indication level, two things. One, that the market price for an indication can just be very different between different two different diseases with the same product, but also that the drug's value or assets value can be very different or different patient responses and different indications which reflect that value. So I do think we'll get to this point of seeing some more indication level contracting and pricing. Uh, the integration between the pharmacy and the medical is interesting. I think we're seeing that accelerate, which represents an opportunity, but also something that may be a potential challenge. The opportunity being that with this integration comes the opportunity to really articulate a more holistic value prop for the therapy, combining the pharmacy and the medical. Uh, the challenge is looking at, you know, in this world where it's integrated, thinking about your access strategy and having to navigate, which will be in step through uh, therapies on another benefit or into medical benefits uh, contracting discussions. Uh, the third one gets into the idea of uh, new specialty tiers to help the, help the patient. So that will drive additional competition within um, these classes where now you're competing for that preferred specialty tier where if you're on the high tier, that patient may face that 33% co-insurance, but now if you get the preferred tier, we don't know what that rate would be, or, but it could be a you know, level that really change behavior around and ensuring adoption realization of that preferred specialty just reduce the patient out of the pocket, but also drive the competitive dynamics. And then lastly, uh, inflation caps. Really, I think you know, the, you know, this really just, this becomes the norm. It just impacts the ability to use pricing as a lever to manage, to manage growth for the brand. Um, so as a, a quick run through on the US that affordability, I think we could spend a lot of time talking about any one of these topics, but uh, you know, for now, it's a high-level overview, so uh, Chris, back to you. Thanks, Jason. Um, we'll move on now from affordability to evidence. And, uh, yeah, pricing is clearly driven by evidence availability and acceptability. And I, I think we're seeing two situations are increasingly occurring. One is which the trend towards having to undertake price negotiations based on very little data, as we might see through the absence of randomized control trials, data uh, license here on the basis of uh, open labels, single arm studies, or, or even what we're seeing most recently in oncology, uh, potentially tumor agnostic license here leading to pricing and indications, whereas actually there is, there is no data, no clinical data. And on the other side, we're seeing an abundance of data and increasing acceptability of multi-source data, including real-world evidence. So very quickly, um, on the left-hand side of the slide where you've got a, a lack of data, then non-comparative data plus modeling is acceptable in health technology assessment and price negotiations where uh, in circumstances where randomized control trials are not appropriate, as we might see where randomized control trials are not ethical, feasible, or practical. Um, 
Uh, and there's already guidance from the FDA and EMA about uh, the situations in which uncontrolled studies are acceptable. Um, and uh, basically, they are acceptable where uh, a change is clearly attributable to the therapy, a placebo response is minimal, prognosis is, blink, is bleak, and there is no acceptable control arm. And in addition, it's also very important that the endpoint must be hard and objective and not subjective. Um, and indeed, the non-comparative studies may the, be, provide the best available evidence. Um, and um, but what's most interesting here, I think, is the ne the need quite often to have modelling in parallel with the non-comparative data. And so, comparison of single arm trial with an artificial comparator arm built out of real world data based on modelling has been used in regulatory submissions within both the FDA and EMA, and also in in in, in various health technology assessments. And. Moving on now to talk about where you have a, a lot of data, and the positive thing here is that health technology assessments are, and pricing negotiations are increasingly embracing data and evidence beyond traditional randomized controlled trials. And, and I've taken the, the information on the left-hand side on the types of data, which I won't go through, from a, a nice consultation in the UK about a year and a half ago. And the result of that consultation being that data, providing that it is um, of a sufficient methodological robustness and standard is acceptable from all of those sources on the left. Uh, but I just take home on this slide, demonstrating value in pricing negotiations using multi-source data does need forethought and planning. You should always consider data to be an investment and you should analyze, evaluate it as such. And when we're talking with our clients, we always remind them that the cost of not having data may far, far exceed the cost of generating it or accessing it. The other thing that we're seeing is that increasingly a shift towards strategic partnerships between manufacturers and data providers, they're becoming increasingly necessary to source data for HTA and price assessment. And I'll just pick one example out of here, the acquisition of Flatiron by Roche um, a couple of years ago granted them access to 2.2 million uh, active patient records, which could be used for helping build their pricing um, uh, propos their value proposition uh, and supporting their pricing strategy. The other thing is we talk a lot about real world data, but um, we, we rarely ask ourselves, and it's critically important, increasingly important uh, in, uh, in, in pricing, but a one size fits all approach does not apply to the selection of real world data sources. And it's very important that the selection process for the data should be customized to the research question, the target audience, and the stage you're at in your product development. And we basically, with Ipsos, have three basic questions relating to data availability, data relevance, and data reliability. Uh, and you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the payers in my negotiation experience always come down to, the, to discuss the representative of data and the robustness of the data and the reliability of the data. And when you come to use real world evidence within your HTA and pricing negotiations, it's not even necessary that your product is actually on the market because you can establish a baseline pre-launch around what is the standard of care, what is the financial impact of the disease, what is the burden of illness on both the, uh, the, 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 the healthcare system but also on the patient and what are the unmet needs well before launch to establish your, your, your baseline and then post-launch leverage data on usage uh, claims, clinical effectiveness, safety, budget impact, and cost effectiveness. And the good news is that HTA, health technology assess assessment organizations, are increasingly accepting a broader range of data sources. I won't go this, but there have been announcements in the last year from both England, NICE, France, the Higher Authority for Health, uh, and the, in Germany, the ICWIG and the Common Federal Committee, the Gemundes, uh, Gemeinsames Bundes Ausschuss, relating to uh, increased acceptability of uh, data, breadth of data. And we've had similar announcements by CADTH in Canada, ISA in the US, PBAC in Australia, here in South Korea, and, and UNETATA in, in, in Europe. So that, that's really the, the section on, 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 uh, on evidence, the two extremes of there isn't much, 
Well, there's a lot. Um, we're now moving on to value attribution, or what is it and, and why is it important, and why will it be increasingly important in pricing in the future? Um, and, and I'm going to consider two situations where this may be the case, both of which are actually relevant today. One is the pricing of combination therapies and stacks of drugs, which you see typically in oncology. And the other one is price negotiation uh, that is spread across multiple manufacturers and multiple technologies, such as you're seeing with the challenges of precision medicine, biomarkers, diagnostics, genomics, digital health, uh, apps, wearables, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And the simple one of stacks is that, you know, in many diseases, you use several medicines. Uh, in combination, uh, using complementary mechanisms of action or in close sequence. And these deliver better outcomes for patients. And in the case of oncology, can often deliver longer treatment durations as progression-free survival and overall survival are extended. And we see that within our Ipsos uh, oncology therapy monitors that uh, uh, we use a lot in, the, in this area. Also, there's some really interesting insights that came from a recent conference uh, presented by the Office of Health Economics in the UK, where they say that HGA often concludes that the additional benefits from adding a new medicine to a currently reimbursed medicine does not necessarily represent value for money to the health care system, particularly when you're, you, if you're using cost per quality approaches to assess value, because a clinically effective medicine may even be found to be non-cost effective at zero price when used as part of a treatment regimen that increases treatment duration. Um, and you know, we, we have been working with Ipsos for, for several years in this area, and we, I, we, I'm just extracting here from a publication we gave at uh, HISPOR in Glasgow uh, three, three and a half years ago now, and that in order to be successful in this area, you need the alignment of four factors. You have to have payers and manufacturers willingness to change and adapt. You have to have open access data infrastructure, you have to have transparent and methodologically robust analytics. And you need a systematic approach to defining relative value that is perceived by all stakeholders as being un unbiased uh, uh, and comprehensive. Um, now, this is a, a pricing challenge where value attribution brings all sorts of um, uh, of contractual and legal issues to market because you have a multi-product regimen. Uh, that may have multiple owners, and you are prohibited by competition law to negotiate with each other on the prices of the individual constituent elements that comprise the regimen. And so you cannot come with a proposal for an agreed total treatment costs. Whereas if you only have one owner, where all constituents are owned by a single company, then of course that company will be able to present a total cost of regimen that is satisfactory to the payer and price the constituent uh, medicines accordingly, offering discounts as necessary. Um, in actual fact, the payers are becoming very wise to this challenge. And yeah, I was certainly involved recently in a, uh, uh, a payer negotiation where they were negotiating, I think it was in multiple bioloma, their price, and the negotiators brought in the manufacturer of the uh, other parts of the com uh, combination regimen to try and negotiate their price downwards, given there would be increased utilization of both products um, in that marketplace. So the fundamental questions here are how should the payers decide? Who, how should value and revenues be allocated between companies? And what are the implications for the other indications of the constituent medicines? And basically, there are uh, four problems that need to be solved. And again, I, I, I'd like to reference the Office of Health Economics here. There's the incentive problem, the value attribution problem. How do you actually uh, attribute the value in a combination to the constituent medicines in the regime. There's a competition law problem. And probably the most important of these at the end is actually is the implementation problem. Because if you could solve the previous problems one to three, uh, they will still need to be implemented within a given pricing and reimbursement system, its laws and policies. Uh, and that requires, as, as Jason mentioned, things like the, 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 some sort of indication-based pricing, multi-use pricing, ring fencing. Um, and 
you know, even more pragmatic solutions such as weighted average prices that are being adopted. Certainly, we're seeing these issues being actively addressed at the moment in countries as far apart as France uh, and Australia. And I think as we as we go forward, we'll see this more and more of an issue. Um, and indeed, it becomes even more challenging when we consider the codependent value spread across multiple manufacturers and technologies. Uh, and let's consider this example. You know, you, you have a manufacturer developing uh, remote real-time monitoring, maybe having an app. Uh, in addition, you may be in, in, in the oncology space where you actually have a diagnostic that uh, is uh, identifying biomarkers which will be used to inform therapy, therapeutic strategy. And then you have a couple of manufacturers. Uh, you have um, manufacturer one uh, who's producing drug one in this combination therapy, a manufacturer uh, four, who's bringing drug two into the combination therapy or stack. And all of this is linked together by software, algorithms, and potentially predictive analytics. Now, this actually isn't that futuristic. We've just had a situation, for example, in Germany, I believe, where in recent weeks, uh, an app in breast cancer has been reimbursed, which obviously, uh, because it's been reimbursed, the payers have concluded that it contributes value to the overall decision, the overall disease management of the patient who is uh, being subjected to uh, diagnoses to detect their type of breast cancer and also is being treated by different therapeutics. So, you know, you have a situation there where somebody has to put a value, an attribute value to part of uh, a sort of multifactorial, multi-manufacturer, multi-technology uh, disease management. So what are the solutions? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's something that we will be working on going forward. Is it a DRG for a disease, which incorporates all these pieces together to give a more holistic view of cost and value and outcome? Or do you price everything separately? But if you do, how do you take this forward and price according to overall health gain, which is dependent on all the parts of the treatment process? Again, something we're increasingly working with our clients to, to address. Again, often from a, most importantly from a pragmatic perspective. In which case, I'm going to hand over now to Jason to give a, a, a view on value attribution from the US. Jason? Okay, thanks, Chris. All right. So the US one we want to focus on oncology. And when it comes to oncology pricing, you know, a lot goes into that. It's very complex. But we want to focus on really three key considerations uh, within oncology. The first is the importance of net cost recovery, so practice economics. The second, looking at total cost of care. And then really the third being the the third party value assessments. Um, you know, all this assumes that an agent or a regiment has received the you know, NCC endorsement that and really ensures payer coverage. But then once you get beyond that, we're looking at these levers. And the really question for us is, you know, how will the, the importance of each one of these shift over shift over time? And if we go to the next page, think about uh, um, oncology and value-based care. This is just an excerpt from the latest uh, report from OCM um, from this year. And really what it's fine, the, the ship findings are is that you know, for OCM, oncology by based care, in general, you know, there have been some you know, pockets of success. However, as, as a whole, it's really not achieving its intended objectives around improving outcomes and reducing drug spend. Uh, so you see a lot of these quotes taken directly from the reports. And knowing that with OCM, that I think we have another year of OCM before we ship to OCF in the future, the question becomes, what will OC, like, how will that evolution what will be the change from OCM to OCF? Go to the next page, Chris. As we think about the next the next iteration of OCM, how do we think that will change to address some of the shortcomings of today? And then really what will be the implication on pricing strategies? And when you look at the, the proposed OCF model and some of the, the comments we're seeing, essentially you can summarize is that we're going to more one capitation. And today it's you know, a lot of fee for service reimbursement plus the MEOs. But in the future, it's more capitation. So the evaluation, the monitoring, the drug admin, overall more capitation. There's a question around how far can the capitation go? Will that include lab um, diagnostics? Will that include the drug add-on payments? That's a big question mark. Also, the patient population is expanding. You know, today it's really it starts those patients receiving chemo. That starts an event. In the future, it's really broad enough to include those patients plus those on hormone therapy or those under surveillance. So now we have more capitation, larger patient populations, 
and then for the the, the cost of care, total cost of care benchmarks that drive the performance-based payment, performance-based payments, having novel therapy adjustments at a cancer type level, and also looking at total cost of care from a more at a tumor type disease progression level. And really looking at, you know, taking these all together, the question is how will this, where's this going again? And what does it mean as you're developing a pricing strategy for an oncology agent or regimen? So go to the next page. This is just you know, three things that we know we're thinking about. One is how far will the capitation go in the future? So if we're going to award more value, award more value-based care in oncology, more practices shifting in the community to OC and OCF type reimbursements, and as more capitation, how far can that go? Based on that, how will that change preferences for treatment choice? Will we choose regimens that have shorter infusions, more oral sub-Q options? And from a pricing standpoint, it's really just understanding like that practice economic incentive, how that's changing, and how from a community practice standpoint, that importance of net cost recovery versus total cost of care, that trade-off, how is that really changing? So we get to a world where the, the drug add-on payment is bottom into the capitation, then you, you the buy and bill incentive is not gone, but it's it's, a, it's a, even a level playing field now. So how does that impact practice economics and how you price? Uh, the next piece looks at uh, the total cost of care benchmarks. Um, they're expected to vary by tumor type and cancer stage. And thinking about those benchmarks, how that impacts performance-based pricing, what could, what could happen? You know, looking at this, you may have models that predict that as a patient progresses, the spend is expected to increase as they progress. Therefore, regimens are expected to get more expensive. And that, that could impact um, what is prescribed a FDA approved NCC endorsed regimen for first line that may shift that to a later line just based off of that, you know, that total cost of care benchmark for the earlier lines. Also, if you're looking at two regimens that have very similar combinations, you may swap out one agent. Um, if you look at the cost of care bench, the cost of care data, one may have a shorter cost of care where in the first year they're the more cost effective option. For the second regimen, they become more cost effective after two years. So again, if you have those two choices, how would you as a practice where you're reimbursed under six month cost of care benchmarks, would you be willing to pick a regimen that has that longer care view? And how do you influence that? But really, you know, the implications make sure that your pricing is aligned and reflects the, you know, the, the value of the brand and the regimen and how that value varies across tumor types and cancer stage. And also that it reconciles with the six month total cost of care benchmarks. Yeah. And then on the commercial side, where we're seeing payers use uh, clinical pathways to you know, sometimes research choice. Now, if they have that data showing how cost of care varies by regimen, by tumor stage, even though something is NCC and endorsed and preferred, it's covered as FDA approval, it still may not be included in a peer pathway where it's relegated to later lines. So as a you know, pricing strategist, this idea of you know, looking at you know, payers' willingness to restrict choice in their pathway, even though it's already covered and approved, but how does that, that behavior impact your pricing and how much you're willing to invest to try to drive earlier line use to you know, ensure that uh, patients have access, especially in practices that are heavily reimbursed under OCM and they, they, that really drives their decision-making. Again, like you know, all these these are very meaty topics, but you know, happy to go to any in more detail. Um, yeah, that's just, you know initial thoughts of you know how this topic around value attribution, bundling of oncology regimens, really, uh, you know, where we are in the U.S. today. Um, so for that, back to you, Chris. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> so, uh, so looking ahead and trying to summarize everything that we've done in the last 35, 40 minutes. Looking ahead, I think. Uh, on the affordability front, there will be an increasing need to address who pays for what and what their willingness or ability to pay is. I think when it comes to evidence availability, it's very clear we'll have more and more alternative, often unstructured data sources available that will need to be integrated. I think the focus here needs to be the integration of these multiple data sources. It's not just the data sources in isolation. And finally, on value attribution, I think uh, we conclude there will be a shift in focus from the assessment of a drug in isolation to a more holistic assessment of the value of disease management. And this will involve multiple manufacturers and multiple technologies. Uh, 
so value and revenue attribution will be very, very important for price and HTA negotiation. So at, at that point, we'll finish and um, we'll, we'll, we'll move to, I think we've got a, a short while left. We've probably got about only about five minutes. Those of you that have submitted questions online, Jason and I will follow up with you outside of this um, this this webinar, um, the three uh, people who were responsible for putting this webinar together are the people you see on the screen, and be very happy to follow up with you on those email addresses. But first of all, just taking one or two questions in the few remaining minutes, um, Jason, you touched upon this, I think, in the affordability section. You know, pricing and affordability has been discussed as a priority in the U.S. for several years now. What would it take to trigger real change in the U.S.? That's a good question, Chris. Um, you know, I like uh, I like looking to my crystal ball, but um, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, this, like I said, this has been discussed for a number of years. Um, it's an ongoing topic, but I think you know, recently with the you know, the launch of these gene therapies, uh, these curative therapies with the high upfront cost, the the longer term outcomes uncertainty. I think that you know, it causes a couple of challenges, which could trigger real change. One is just around the affordability of being able to finance and fund that upfront piece. And I think I mentioned that, or if you're a self an employer with a relatively small employee base, you know, one or two of these patients on this could really break your healthcare budget. So that leads to more pool, you know, pooling of resources, pursing stop loss. Um, again, it's the idea of like, you know, larger member base to spread risk, which now you're going down towards, you know, trying to recreate, um, single peer like constructs in a commercial population. So again, I can risk like expanding that. That plus the, the time dimension of, of that uncertainty of if you're looking at a five to seven year window where value is being realized and given patients ship switching commercial plans in the US, how do you, the risk sharing helps, but then once patients are switching plans and you go to the next employer, their willingness to take on you know, any continued payments if you have a favorite time model. I think like that the cost and the time dimension really gets in this idea of you know, one, we need to look at risk sharing, but also you know the idea of Medicare negotiating price for this. And that's step one. That, and then, then could we additionally see a Medicare carve out to where they're doing the price negotiation, but also they are taking the risk of the patient. So you eliminate that idea, the risk of patients switching between plans. You know, if we go down that path, that begs the question of where does it stop? You know, is it just the song gene therapies or is it just therapies over a certain price point? But that really opens the door to more universal coverage, single pair of coverage, certain therapies. And perhaps it's something like this where you have enough of these, you know, these therapies that, again, are high cost up front, long term outcomes are uncertain. Does that really reach a tipping point where, as an employer, you just can't afford to continue to pay for this and we're going down this path? All right. Thanks for that, Jason. Thanks for that insight. We've got a couple of others. I think we might have time just for one more question. Uh, <clears throat> the one that came in the line, uh, to what extent do you feel international price referencing will become more relevant in the U.S. going forward? I think the person who issued it, they heard about the most favored nation model last year. And, you know, what are your views on uh, the future? Will international reference pricing become a fact within the U.S. or have any influence on any part of the U.S. market? Or what are your thoughts on that? I, mean, I know it's still being you know, it's, it's still being discussed. It's still you know all kind of on the table. It's you know, you know there is this desire of you know to reduce drugs in the U.S. for the Medicare population, um, part you know, part for the Part B drugs where you see the high spend for beneficiary. Um, you know I, I can see where that will become more like a, a tool to look to really look at national you know, price. Now does that become the norm for setting prices for Part B drugs? Again, it can be more like a political discussion, I'm not really sure. But I do think if you get to the point where Medicare is allowed to negotiate prices, then they will need tools for these therapies that lack competitive op options. And so they, I can see them factoring in international price indexes to really help inform their decision making. I think that'd be one of their tools. I think I mentioned the other tool would be around um, ICER like or HC like assessments to bring those two things here to allow them to make informed, to arm them or equip them to negotiate. 
Thanks, Jason. I think I think we're we're running out of time to take any okay. further questions. We have them. We'll follow up independently with those people that have uh, submitted them. I think in addition. Uh, um, the, those people that have registered this webinar uh, will be following up with you to send you a copy of the recording. Uh, and again, if you have any questions uh, on any of the topics in this webinar or any of the issues in any of those markets, uh, if you can email either myself, Chris Teal, uh, Jason Boller, or Adrian Grass, we'll be delighted to follow up with you. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day and uh, thank you for your time in attending our web webinar today. Uh, bye.